Augustina was eight years old when a friend invited her to a neighbor's house in Uruguay. Aunt Marita tells great Bible stories every Friday evening, her friend said. You should come. Augustina asked her mother for permission to go, and she agreed on the condition that the two of them went together. Her mother wanted to hear what kind of stories Aunt Marita was telling. On Friday evening, they went to Aunt Marita's house. Aunt Marita read a story from the Bible, then everyone sang songs about Jesus. When the sun went down, she said the Sabbath had begun, and she prayed. Augustina enjoyed the meeting and begged her mother to let her go again. They went together again the next Friday, but after that, her mother allowed Augustina to go by herself. After a while, Augustina learned that on every Sabbath, Aunt Marita went to a small Seventh-day Adventist church a few blocks from her house. She asked if she could go with her to church, and her mother agreed. Sabbath became the best day of the week for Augustina. She was thrilled to welcome the Sabbath at Aunt Marita's house with a Bible story, singing, and prayer on Friday evening. She jumped out of bed with joy on Sabbath morning to go to church with Aunt Marita. At church, Augustina fell in love with the Sabbath school class. She especially liked hearing mission stories from the Mission Quarterly about children around the world. It was inspiring to hear how God was using the mission offerings to change the lives of kids just like her. Although she was young, she listened to the sermons very carefully. Soon she began to study the Bible. The more she read the Bible, the more she learned about Jesus and his love. She decided to give her heart to Jesus and get baptized. A short time later, someone told her that there was an Adventist school in Uruguay. Augustina wanted to study there, but her mother said public school was better because it was free. Augustina did not give up. She prayed for many months to study at the Adventist school. Then her church participated in a special 10 days of prayer program with other churches around the world. Augustina prayed extra hard. At the end of the 10 days, her mother agreed to send her to the Adventist school. She was so happy. God had answered her prayers. God even helped them find money to pay for the school tuition. Augustina loves Jesus with all her heart. It's so amazing to know that someone like Jesus could love me so much that he gave his life for me, she says. Hello friends and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is James Rafferty and we are in lesson number three, the birdcage of the quarter for this week, which is entitled In the Crucible with Christ. To my left is Pastor Ryan Day. It's always good to be here and my lesson is entitled Bitter Waters. Bitter Waters. Wow. And Pastor John Loma Cain, what's your lesson entitled? The Great Controversy in the Desert. Mm. Wow, mm, okay. it's gonna be very interesting. Very interesting. Pastor John Denzi, glad you're with us. What's your lesson entitled? Thank you. It's Wednesday, An Enduring Legacy. An Enduring mm -hmm. Legacy. Yes. All right. And Jill Morricone, 
you have the final lesson for the week. Thursday's lesson, what's it entitled? I do. It's trial by fire. We're going to look at seven keys to walk through trials. Nice. Oh, okay, looking right. forward to that. <laughs> All right, well, we are starting out here in the birdcage. And before we do that, we want to have just a word of prayer, just to ask the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Ryan, would you like to have our prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we are gathered here on this panel for you, Lord. Um, mm. We recognize that your word is life-saving, and that's why we are here, to get to know you more and your will for our life. So as all of our viewers are watching now and we are gathered here studying together, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Draw us closer to you and, and, and to a better understanding of your will for our life. And may we be drawn closer to each other in the process as we study. We ask yeah. in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Well, our lesson study has a number of scripture readings for this week, Exodus 14, 15, also part of 17, Proverbs 3, Luke chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at the memory text, which is 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. Let's just take a look there and read this text. In this you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And now I wanted to emphasize that little phrase there, if need be. <laughs> I, I remember a man telling me when I, early on in my Christian experience, that we need to pray sometimes the prayer, Lord, save me and make it easy. <laughs> but if you can't make it easy, save me anyway, right? <laughs> and it reminded me of this Bible verse. It's a crucibles, the, the situations, the circumstances that we go through and how these circumstances um, are there to mold us and, um, and prepare us for heaven. Let us pray. Our loving Father and our God, we are so grateful for this opportunity to be in this building again. We're so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to be alive because we know across the world there are families who are grieving, uh, even in our very communities, there may be people grieving um, the loss of loved one. And um, when we're alive, Father, we have the opportunity to accept you and to be saved. And so we praise your name for all the mercies that you keep on giving to us. And as we gather this morning to review the lesson study, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be here with us to inspire us, to teach us, to, um, and to bless us, Lord. We pray for those viewing online who are not able to be present with us here in the church, that you will be beside them to bless them as well. And may our hearts be filled with your grace and be filled with your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so lesson number three. Uh, the bird cage. As I said before, I found it to be a very interesting lesson, uh, very relevant. So the first question I have to you, to anyone, is what would you, do you think that these lessons that we're studying are relevant and why do you think they are relevant? Do you think the lessons that we're studying about crucibles and about temptation and trials and circumstances, is it relevant? And why is it relevant for us living in these last days to be exposed to this kind of material? Um, anybody have a point? Yes, uh, I must say it is relevant. And, um, in these last days, yes, for sure. And talking about trials, it, trials are there to make us strong. And this, that's why it's relevant, to make us understand that when we are going through tough times, know that God is the one allowing it to happen. That's what I'm learning from this. Right. That's for us to recognize him and to what's there for us to learn out of it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, brother. So last week, we, I think we were exposed to the idea that even when we are going through the valley of the shadow of death, that it's the shepherd that has led us there. Right? He's always with us. He has never, he will never leave us or forsake us as he has promised us in the Bible. So when we're on the mountaintop, we feel so good. God is there. When we're in the valley, we feel so low. God is there. And so 
as we studied this week's lesson, we were exposed again to the Israelites and how on their journey from Egypt, and they went through circumstances, they went through hard times, and we see how they responded to those situations. And so we're, I'm hoping that uh, we're few in numbers, but we can share a little bit um, about the Israelite and the, the, the following days. So the lesson, the birdcage, it says, the memory text this week, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. First Peter 1 verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And the introduction to the lesson says, in the full light of day and in the hearing of the music of other voices, the caged bird will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snatch of this, a trill of that, but never a separate and entire melody. But the master covers the cage and places it where the bird will listen to the, to the one song he is to sing. In the dark he tries, and he tries again, to sing the song until it is learned and he breaks forth in perfect melody. Then the bird is brought forth, and ever after he can sing that song in light. Thus, God's deal, thus God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us, and when we have learned it amid the shadow of affliction, we can sing it ever afterward. Ellen, that's taken from Sister White, the Minister of Healing. Notice that the one who carries the bird into the darkness is the master himself. It is easy to understand that Satan causes pain, but would God himself actively take part in guiding us into crucibles where we experience confusion or hurt? That's the question this week, and the answer came out quite vividly in the lesson. This introduction brought my mind to something. Um, the, the point just slipped me. <laughs> But, all right, it will, it will come back. So on Sunday, the title of the lesson says, To the Promised Land Via the Dead End. And this is where we were introduced to the story of the Israelites being taken from Egypt, um, heading towards the Promised Land. Um, and Sunday, we see the Israelites, they came up on their first challenge. And how did they respond to that first challenge? So, it says here, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. I'm always amazed of the experience of the Israelites because they had so many examples. Even before leaving Egypt, they were exposed to God's marvelous power. It was his power, it was his grace that brought them out of Egypt. And let, I could even go a step further that they were a people of promise. Um, Abraham got the promise, of, hey, you're going to be the descendants of of many, but your people are going to be um, enslaved in a land, but they're going to come out after. And so they should have been a people who, who knew that God's hand was on them. They were a special set. They were a special people. And so it always amazes me to see their response to difficulties um, when they came, as if they always forget that they are God's special people. And um, it goes back to us today. You have a point, Andre? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> we have to, um, I have to always look at this from perspective. They were slaves. They had no privileges. Any outstanding uh, thought and express was probably punished quickly. Um, they were suppressed. They were not allowed to think freely. Um, so then, uh, there were how long, how many, there was like 400 years, they had in, in Egypt, and they lost a lot of this, in, this experience um, that caused them not to know really what God can do. And uh, they, they were just 
crawling first. They, they were learning. They become to know they didn't, they had no idea what really God can do, can take care of them. They have those, had those bad habits, a lot of them. They were so embedded in their minds. Even though they saw what God had done through the miracle of, of those plagues, you know, there was a few of them that touched them, not severely, but all the other ones touched only Egyptians. This was, I do not know how long this took, but I doubt it was like taking decades. It was a matter of, of weeks, I guess. They had, they've been still developing, they've been still learning, uh, discovering what God can do. And uh, we, we know all the stories from the Bible. We, we, we hear somebody says something or what happened to us, but when something is present danger now, will the Lord delivers me out of it? We do not know. Mm -hmm. The only thing is we can trust, but this mean you're not afraid? Well, I do afraid if something is going my way. I can only say, Lord, save me. What else I can do? Right? So I'm, we, uh, we're so quick to kind of to judge them because <laughs> they had a lot of those experiences. We, we have the Bible. We have the history that we can, we can anchor to, and, uh, and this gives us comfort. A lot of these people were literal. They, they couldn't read. And even I do not know if those days the, they had anything that would allow them to read the stories. Usually they've been repeating. They had very good memory for those. Yeah, I think there was a method of how they um, communicated their faith. It, it wasn't, for now we have a written Bible, it's more you read it. But then it was passed down through cultures. They had their stories told. As they gaze upon the stars in the night, the stories were told. It was passed down through mm. the word of mouth. And as you said, they had very good memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, coming back, I'll try to put myself into their shoes, being in this environment, being afraid all my life. Being afraid. Because, you know, the Egyptians, they had no mercy. And the farther they went with those plaques, the harder they were on them. So uh, it's, uh, I tried to find myself, probably I would act like them, they did, probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough, tough stuff, but that, that's, that's how it was. And the Lord was with them, doesn't matter. And uh, we are grateful that, you know, they went all through all those experiences but that's, that's a lesson for us today, because we leak, we, we, we gain some experience, but then we kind of forgetting and forgetting and mm -hmm. forgetting. And most of the problems that Israel had was that parents that didn't pass all the knowledge to the kids, and it says that this generation didn't remember the past things, and then they've been going down the hill. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my Thank thought. you, brother. You made some very good points there that Israel, they were enslaved, their, their faith was suppressed, uh, so God had to reintroduce them um, to himself, you know. He, he sent Moses down there to tell them that I am, I am. You know, so he had to do that great reintroduction of himself and to his awesome power. My brother, go ahead. I look at it in a different sense. You know, like, we, like looking at us today, Trials come like Israel had trials. And, and when they got the trials, they complain. And they never reflect on how God worked through. You know, I look at the lesson for me there is when we go in through our trials, because remember in Corinthians, he said, these things were our ensemble until the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I've learned from the Israelite walk is that when I'm going through my trials, I need to reflect on what God has done for me. And, and then say, you know what? You've been through there for me. You brought me there this far. So right now, Lord, I know you can do it again. So I'm waiting for you to trust me. The Israelites didn't do that. If they did it from the time when the, the Red Sea was open mm -hmm. and they saw the, the Red Sea closed and they had to reflect on that, then they would trust him all the way. Yeah. That's how I look at it. 
And that's a great point. Um, because in our Christian walk, it's not, it's not one save, always save. So you're going to have difficulties, you're going to have trials, you're going to have different situations coming at you. But if you're able to reflect on that one victory that you had last week, then you're better able to, to meet that temptation that you're having this week. And then the following week, you're able to reflect on those two victories, and you continue to grow in grace, you continue to grow in God. Uh, I think that is one of the secrets to living a successful Christian life. Sister White says, um, if, we, if we fail for, to remember what God has done for us in the past, then we're doomed, right? Basically, I'm just not exact words. But... Um, yeah, very important. So the Israelites, they came up onto the Red Sea. Um, the text here says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Um, as Andre said, I think the Israelites had all the reasons to be afraid. They saw the, the, the Egyptian army behind them, to the left, there were rocks. There was a, a mountain, a cliff. They couldn't go. And before them, there was a Red Sea. They were in a, a, a very dangerous situation, a situation that they could not help themselves. And that is what came out in Sunday's lesson, that God sometimes lead us into places where we cannot help our own selves. And it shows us, it should bring us to that point to recognize that we are always dependent upon God. Because that idea leads us to humility. But whenever we feel like we can do without God, then we're, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. Satan thought that he could do his own thing without God. Look at him. And so many other people in the past has um, had the idea that they can be all and do all without God. But um, the, it all boils down to the fact that we are his and under his command. And so it says here, have you ever been set up, led into a trap or a dead end? This is what happened to the Israelites. The second paragraph here says, From the day the Israelites left Egypt to the day they reached the promised land, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they would travel by day or night. Every part of their journey was led by God himself. But look at where he led them first, a place where the sea was before them, mountains were on either side, and Pharaoh's army was in high sight, right behind them. Following the pillar doesn't assure us a constant happiness. A relationship with God, a Christian life, a solid, being a solid Adventist does not guarantee that you will always be happy because we live in a sinful world. And that came out in our lesson this week. But it does guarantee us eventually you will get to a place where happiness will be continual. It guarantees us that we will finally be with God, finally be restored um, completely, and live and reign with him forevermore. And so it says, it's all, it always also can be a hard experience because training in righteousness takes us to places that test our heart, which are so naturally deceitful. During these difficulties, the key to knowing when we are truly following God is not necessarily the absence of trial or pain, but rather an openness to God's instruction and a continual submission of our minds and hearts to his leading. We go back to the point of humility. We have to be humble under God's hand and be willing to follow him wherever he leads us. Uh, I mean, sometimes we, we are faced with circumstances and we say, why me, Lord? Why me? If, if not you, then who? You know? Do you, do you want it to be your sister sitting beside you or do you want it to be your mother? Why, why, why not you? But God will... I was talking to my mother yesterday and I was telling her that she looks like a 16-year-old. And she says to me, it's the stress. I say, Mom... It can't be distressed. It must be God's blessing on you. 
You know? So sometimes we assert, we assert God's blessing to the wrong place. But we need to recognize that no matter how life is tough, it can be stressful, it can be hard, but God is the one that keeps you. He keeps you in the fire. He keeps you um, in the waters. He will, he will always be with us, and that's a promise that we can hold on to. All right, moving on to Monday, bitter waters. Anyone has a point on the lesson so far? Anything you want to share that we missed on Sunday? What in? Yeah. The, the dependency upon self. Mm-hmm. So he brought them to a point where they could not do anything of themselves, basically. They had to rely on him. And the lesson, as you rightly said, is for us today to rely to realize that it doesn't matter what we may have, the resources that we may have at our, right. at our disposal or level of education, whatever it is. Jesus wants to bring us to that point where we become dead to self and totally rely on him and realize that Without him, we can't do anything. So he, they were at this point now, and it is even with, with us today. Sometimes we find ourselves in some situation, and we are, we, we become, myself, we, I become frustrated about what is gonna, I'm going to do tomorrow. What is it I'm going to mm-hmm. do next week? But the Lord is saying, I'll provide for you today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just remember that I will be always be there. And even sometimes we, we take that promises to say that he will always be there. We think that always going to be a smooth sailing. Right. But it's, it's not always a smooth sailing. It's that the, the shepherd taking out the sheep. It's not all the time that the, the shepherd is going to find the best pasture. But the sheep can rest assured that he's going to find the place where he has the, the, well, the best pasture. But it might take time to get to there. Mm-hmm. So he, he take them here. They feed here today. When they get there tomorrow, there might be no feeding. So they're going to go through a process where there's no feeding, but right. they can rest assured that he's going to take them to the best place where they can get the proper feeding. That's right. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, brother. So rest assured, friends, we're going to get to green pastures. One day we'll get over yonder where there will be happiness forevermore. So on um, Monday, we saw the lesson, Bitter Waters. And once again... Um, God had led the Israelites to a different place. And so the text here, Exodus 17, verse 1, it says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from, the pla- from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rebfim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And so it says here, perhaps we might not get from God everything we want, but couldn't we expect to get all that we need, wants and needs? Not what we think we need, but what we truly need. There was one thing that the Israelites certainly needed, and that was water. Just after God in the cloud led the Israelites through the Red Sea, they followed him through the hot, waterless desert for three days. Particularly the desert where finding water is so critical. Their desperation is understandable when they would get to the water they need. When would they get the water they needed? So where does God lead them? The pillar goes to Mara, where at last there is water. Praise the Lord. Amen? <laughs> but, <laughs> but when they get to Mara, they have been excited, but they went, when they tasted the water, it was bitter. What did you get from that? And, and is there any lesson in that? God leads them to Mara. They are desperate for water. But when they taste the water, it is bitter. Is there a lesson in that? Um, I don't know if anyone else got it, but even I was I stepped off for a while. But even on Sunday, um, like I got a hint that you know God. Well, the lesson says it. It says that you know God leads us to a path where there may be pain and hurt and and I would. I would want to think otherwise because he's our good shepherd. He would not lead us to a pain of hurt. But the problem is not with God. It's really with us. Right. Because of all these trials, God has really given us opportunities to trust in him. 
Because I think of Job, when Job, you know, had his experience, God has said, where were you when I created this, when I told that not to go that further? So I, like the question there where it says, you know, no, what do you think um, the first, uh, perhaps we might not get from God everything we want, but couldn't we expect to get all that we need? It makes me think back to Garden of Eden. God created everything, and then he created Adam and Eve. So I guess the point I'm making is that all these trials, like the previous lesson we studied, is for us to really get the point that God wants to perfect our character. Right. And these things that are happening are to perfect our character if we stop complaining and doubting then our character will be fine-tuned faster. Yeah. Well, yeah. My brother, you have a point. Yes. I totally agree with this. Uh, we constantly mention that God leads us in the unseemly path, which I think is erroneous. God leads us into righteousness. And wherever he finds us, he finds a solution for us. Mm -hmm. He finds a solution. He doesn't necessarily lead us into unrighteousness mm -hmm. or danger. When he leads us, he leads us in the path of righteousness. And if we find, or if we find ourselves in danger, he finds a solution for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing, brother. I came up, up across a, uh, a quote today. Yes, this week that says, God will never lead us any place where his grace can keep us. So anywhere God leads you, anywhere you follow God, be sure that his grace will keep you there. Go ahead, Odin. Yeah, as, as related to the question that you asked, um, why God would bring them to this, the water that is bitter. Mm -hmm. All right. In, as Sister Colleen rather said, it's, it's not God that feels there. It's basically the people and us. And it's a lesson to us as well because we constantly fail. If you realize they fail to remember where God brought them from. Because the moment that they realized that the water was bitter, they, they started to complain. They, they said, they grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? And he continued in that day. Are you, have you brought, it, brought, brought us out here to taste bitter water? Yes. So the moment they, they experience something difficult, they have the, the human expectation that God is no longer with them. Because right. the human expectation is that once you're walking with God, it will be a smooth sailing. There will be no obstacles. So for example, now, our bitter situation might be that we're traveling a far distance, we're traveling to go to a different province, and for whatever reason, the car broke down in the middle of nowhere. That could be your bitter situation. Is it that you're gonna suddenly doubt and say, oh, where is God? Where is God? Is God with us? We are going on his mission, but the car broke down in the middle of nowhere. Is it that God is, is no longer with us? He's saying, no, while you're on this journey, as I said before, Trials are going to come. Situations are going to occur. Because remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but principalities, right? The devil is at war with us. So there is no, as a Christian, you should expect to always face some bitter situation. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, once you remain faithful, once you remain steadfast, once you remain, keep your eyes on the prize and stay mm -hmm. on track, then you know that there is a, Victory, victory coming at the yeah, end of it. For sure. Thanks, Serene. So this lesson um, is very simple. There wasn't a lot of theological things in this lesson. But for me, it brought me to one fundamental thing, that we must trust God so foolishly. We must trust God so foolishly because there is absolutely no danger on this earth where it's too dangerous for God. So let's use Brother Odin's example. You're traveling to, um, to Manitoba from, from here, and your car breaks down on the, the highway, 
Trans Canada Highway in a very remote location, and you're worried that robbers are going to come or wild animals are going to come. God can keep you. There's nothing, nowhere too dangerous for God. And so, you see, when we talk about trust, we, we, we oftentimes talk about trusting God when, when things seem like it's going to work out for us. When we can see that, hey, it looks like it's going to work out. But that's not real trust. You see, trust is, is, trust is like Abraham trusting. When he was bringing Isaac up the mountain, he, he, was, he, he, he was just trusting God. 100%. He wasn't holding back anything. That is trust. You know, go ahead, my brother. Is it Max? I'm sorry, I didn't recognize it was you. <laughs> <laughs> my brother, uh, I look not bitter water and I see love of God in the bitter water. Because God loves the children of Israel so much. He wanted them to trust him so much, and they were drifting away. He said, I did all that for you, and you're still, what's going on? Okay, let me give you a bit of water. Come back to me. So when we go, it makes me realize, when we go for trials, look at it as a loving test. Because Jesus, when he came, the Spirit led him to the, the wilderness. Remember that. You know, because that's an example also. Because you know, the father knew Jesus could have stand. That's why he led him. The same way Jesus is doing those things to tell us, listen, I'm with you. Just trust me. Yeah. You can, it can work. You go through your broken times and your car broke down. If you are living like, like, what, like Jesus wants you to live, and you know you're doing everything possible to serve Jesus, when those times come, you say, Father, I'm doing everything you ask me. Tell me what's there to learn. Am I, am I doing my best? And then he comes through. And I've experienced that in my life. I'm just saying, I see love out of bitter water. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Brother Max. Um, remember what God said to Samuel when he saw David? He saw, I don't look on the face how people look like. So in the heart. But the heart. So with all the experiences that... Um, Israelites have what I see. For me, it's God was more interested not in their physical well-being, but in the state of their character. So, and that's what's happening with us too. Yeah, car broke out, whatever. Car broke, big things happen. But it's, I think he's more interested in our reaction to the car, broken car. Mm. Our reaction to what is happening around us. That's why the verse you had on the screen before that Though through manifold temptations, we still rejoice. And <laughs> it's funny, like this week my coworker was like, it's been so tough. How you can keep on without drinking? I can't understand. You know, like it's, people see it around and it's only God who can bring the thing through for us, right? So with bitter water, it's another experience for the Israelites. And we are Israelites. We, we are not to forget that we are repeating their steps. And if we cannot see ourselves in there, there is, you know, we need to see them, ourselves in it. That whatever happens in our life, we are to reflect how do we react to it. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with our character that God is trying to show us? Because material things, God can provide no problem. Like Sister said, he created all of it in, in one word. He right. created material things. But character, that's what he's more interesting with. Absolutely. And that's what brother said, that Satan is happy when we neglect our character development. Mm -hmm. That's where he's happy. Sleep a little while, and I got you. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add to that point, I remember in the, in the scriptures here, a few of the apostles, they were caught and beaten for preaching in the name of the Lord. And they rejoiced that they, um, they suffered the beating um, um, because they were proclaiming the name of Jesus, you know? And so, rightly said, uh, Brother Max, it's all about a character building. God is more concerned with our character building. And Israel, um, everything is so connected. Andre in the beginning said that, hey, these people were, they were enslaved. 
their, their faith was suppressed, and so God had to bring them back from that dark place where they was and to um, uh, lift up their character. Um, and so God brings them to another test here at, at, um, at this bitter water where he's able to say, listen, I am God. No situation is too big for me. And so he brings them to a bitter water, but then he does something marvelous and turns that water into sweet water. And once again, the Israelite had an opportunity to see God's deliverance being displayed and to an opportunity for their faith to grow. All right. Um, is there any other point on Monday's lesson, bitter water? If not, we'll move to Tuesday. The great controversy in the desert. And my brother alluded to this. And so Jesus is led by the Spirit. The, the text here says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And that's from Luke 1, verse 4. Luke 4, verse 1 to 2. So the question is, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from Jesus' temptation in the desert? What are some of the things that you have gleaned from it, whether you're, you're reading Matthew 4 or you're reading Luke 4? What are some of the things that you have seen? How can you face temptations and face trials and face your crucibles based on how you see Jesus himself responded to the devil in, these, in the East text? Go ahead, Cornelia. By walking in the Spirit. By walking in the Spirit, amen. By walking in the Spirit. Any other one? Um, for me, it's only the Word, because where the physical body stops is only the Word of God he had. And that's the only thing Satan can't contend with. Okay. So when we walk with God, meditate upon his words, take it for what it is, and put it in our practical lives, then as a situation, whatever temptation may come, we, we, we go back to the word. The word of God says this. The word, yeah. It is written. It is written. And as we claim those promises, there's much power, you know? And Jesus knew that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was his weapon. And I think I read a quote that says that's the only sword or weapon that we can safely um, use in, in our daily battles. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. The sword of the spirit, we have to put on the full armor. Go ahead, the Max. And, um, he had temptations for 40 days. Before last three temptations, he had 40 days of battle. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we go through difficult times, it's hard to remember when we go through difficult times, but when we do go through difficult times, sometimes enemy reserves the strongest temptation at the end. Mm -hmm. So same thing happened with Jesus. 40 days he was tempted of different things. And then Satan himself came at the end with last three. So don't give up. Victory is promised, like Sister said. Oh, yeah. Don't give up. Victory is promised. Thank you, Brother Max. Albert? Yes. Uh, Christ, tem uh, Christ when, uh, in the des in, when we went through temptations for 40 days, he was repeating what Israel came through. They came out, they came out of Egypt. They had to pass through the Red Sea. They were baptized in the Red Sea. Christ was baptized, went into the desert. But the difference is Christ passed every test that they failed in the desert. So he was a repeat of, of the, uh, he was the second Adam. He was a, pre, a repeat mm -hmm. of Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve didn't, take, didn't go to the test that the ones went through in the desert. But Christ repeated the desert also and passed every test. Amen. That's a good perspective. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead, Odin. Thank you for that, my brother. It's a good perspective as you write a separate entry. Looking at it, and when I apply this situation of Jesus being, being tempted, I look at it and then for some reason, I don't know if I didn't see it before, that the Spirit, it says the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, the wilderness to be tempted. Mm -hmm. So you normally hear that person sometimes say that um, 
like you find yourself in some situation, some some difficult situation or a situation that that um, that you're tempted, and they said you put yourself there. The spirit wasn't with you. That's why you ended up in those situation. But I'm seeing here in the scripture that the scripture that that the the, the, the spirit sometimes do lead you into temptation. So why does it do that? It leads you there because there might be something that Jesus wants to work on in your life. There might be a shortcoming that we need to, and that really came out for me, that we need to work on, that he wants to reveal to ourselves. It might not be evident to us, but when we go through that temptation, then it will reveal to us that shortcoming that we actually have in our life. And I take it back to the point with Peter. He said, Jesus told Peter that the devil wanted to sift him like wheat, but he will pray that he will what? Overcome. He didn't say to Peter, I'm going to stop the devil from doing that, but I'll pray that he will overcome. And when you overcome, what must you do? You must encourage the brethren. So that, 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 that trial to me basically showing that the Spirit led Peter into that temptation to build him, to mold him, to, to help him to get rid of something that Jesus wanted to remove from his life. And that gave me a new perspective on temptation and trials there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, brother. Maybe, maybe I am thinking this. Because I don't think that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. I think he led him to the wilderness, but Satan took the opportunity to go and tempt him because mm -hmm. he knew what state he was in. He was hungry, mm -hmm. and he used that to tempt him. You see, the scripture is for us today is used to build up our attitudes and uh, to uh, our knowledge and our skills to, to deal with the obstacles that we will face. And yeah. so, if, so if we do not develop those three attributes, we're going to fall into disarray. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. So it, it's important for us to understand that it is not God the one that's tempting you into sin, right? But oftentimes, even though you're following God, you, are, you get to places into circumstances where you're at the disposal of the enemy to be tempted. And as Odin said, um, Jesus prayed for Peter. He says, the devil has, has the intention to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that when it comes, I'm not going to stop that, that opportunity from coming your way. But when it comes, I pray that you will overcome it. And so um, both points, they, they, it's the same, we're on the same page, I believe, that we're often led in some places. Not that God is leading us there to be. He's not the one doing the tempting, but the devil takes the opportunity to tempt us. And, um, but I want to share a text before I take you, Brother Elibert. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And it's, 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 this is a text that I always keep very dear to me. It says, I'm reading from NIV. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way of escape so you can endure it. No matter what the devil throws at you, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what temptation comes your way, we have the promise today that God is able. He, he will prepare a way of escape from that temptation that, so that you may overcome. Go ahead, Brother Elibert. I took your point. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Because, because I, I listened to, to both of them, and, I, and, and that's, the, that's the scripture that brings both their points together. Right. And yeah, so, so that's the point I was going to make. All right, that's okay. I wanted to add, I'm going back to the situation at the Red Sea. That was a major problem for the Israelites. Then they came to Mara where the water was bitter, 
better, we would consider a simpler situation. They failed both of them. The Lord was trying to teach them dependence and to have a relationship. That's the key word there, because the Bible tells us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So they had their characters, their vision, their knowledge of Christ wasn't sound enough to understand what he was doing because everything that they wanted was provided, but the relationship was not there. And that's what applies to us too, that we have to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not in our, to our mm -hmm. own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. That's good. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Maybe I'll make this point. Uh, um, the, 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 key, the, the, key, the key thing in all this is prayer. Uh, with, with, with Peter, Jesus said, I have prayed for you. And, and, and as he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, he was, he was fasting and praying. And, and through prayer, with the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit now gives you the, the way of escape when the temptations come. The temptations yeah. come from the devil, but uh, the presence of the Spirit through both prayer and study of the Scriptures will, will give you that uh, point of victory. Thank you. So before I take you, Ode, um, we just have about three minutes left now. But, um, Elibert, I want to connect your point to Sister's point about relationship. You see, you're studying for an exam. You don't prepare for that exam in the exam. You have to prepare for that exam, then you go and sit the exam successfully, amen? And so it's the same thing with us. We have to have a relationship with God before the trial, so that when you're in the trial, you know exactly who to call. If you're in a fire and you're calling, the, um, you're calling your friend, and you're not calling the, the fire ambulance, the, um, the, the, the fire station, you're, you're doing a wrong thing. You know, you got to know who to call on when you're in the trial. And so building that relationship with Jesus, having an active prayer life, knowing God for yourself is absolutely important as we face these crucibles. Uh, Brother Odain, um, my sister, and then Elder, we're going that way. Yes, so I was going to touch on the point that on, on prayer, just the same. And looking at Luke chapter 11, right? And he said, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciple. Verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallow, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive our sins, for we, all, as, for we also forgive Forgive everyone who sin against us and lead us not into temptation. That is a prayer that the Lord was teaching to his disciples. Right. So there are going to come situations where you will be led into temptation. As you rightly said, Jesus is not the one that is doing the temptation, as the scripture rightly said. But you will be led into temptation to make you stronger, to get rid of whatever, whatever crucible that the Lord want to get rid of out of your life. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Odin. My sister. Yeah, I'd just, like, oh, <laughs> just like to read this text that really um, make it clear to me. It's James chapter 1. And I'll read it. Verse 13. You could read along with me. I guess follow along with me. Starting from verse 13. It says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. Right. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own mm. lust and enticed. Then when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Yeah. Do not err any, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift 
is from above, and it continues. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, sister. Pastor Dave. Just, just quickly, I think that we need to remember that all the way through starting with the plagues into traveling through the desert, all those tests were to lead the people towards God. Mm -hmm. When we have trials in our life, we shouldn't be saying, woe is me, but we should be saying, God, what are you trying to teach me here? Absolutely. What, do, what lesson do we have to learn so that we can rise above what the children of Israel did? Like, you know, the 10 plagues were, were for the Egyptians to learn about God as well. Mm -hmm. And it just, all along, God wants us to become closer to him. Yeah. And that's where we need to be saying, ooh. What can I, what do I need to change? What do I need to do to fall into your grace that I can see you more clearly? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Is there any final point from the floor? Well, if not, uh, thank you so much for participating this morning. It's been a great discussion. The, this lesson was very powerful. It was very relevant. And as we continue to study, I pray that you'll open your heart um, to, to the lesson, to the um, and um, that God may continue to help us to grow as we go through life circumstances. Let us pray. Our loving Father and our God, we are so thankful for the difficulties, for the crucibles, for the challenges that you have led us through, and for the victories that we have won. We know, Father, that um, there are people among us. I myself have lost some of the fights too, but we're also grateful this morning that there is still grace, Lord. And so we give you thanks for these lessons that you've been exposing us to. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless our lives and that you'll continue to, to be with us, continue to reach out to us, Lord, and, and uh, with your open arms, willing to save us once we say, yes, I, I, I yield, I yield. And so as we continue the rest of the service, we pray that your Holy Spirit will reside with us and that you will um, touch each heart so that when we leave here today, we will not leave the same way we came. Give us strength, Lord. Empower us with your Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Precious. So I see that you saw William riding the boat. My favorite class that I've taken in junior camp would probably have to be tubing. You just ride on a tube and go really fast in a boat and try to hang on and not fall off pretty much. My favorite class would have to be photography. I think my favorite class has been ceramics. I picked three monkeys and I really like them because it's sort of funny. Well, for first period I'm taking drama, second period I'm taking sign language, third period I'm taking animals, and fourth period I'm taking tie-dye. I have canoeing, which is really fun. <laughs> and I'm taking sailing, and sometimes I get to steer the boat and everything, so it's really cool. BMX is really fun because you hit jumps and you try harder to practice and get better at it. Some of the things I loved in BMX were ramping and drifting. Weathercraft, I made like little turns for people. I I did uh, kayaking. I learned how to shoot arrows. And I learned more about riding horses. My favorite part about camp is going to horses because horses are my favorite animal and I love riding them. Um, what I like best about camp is probably the beach because you, you can like go snorkeling, go on a boat, 
and I can play on the sand if you want, especially when the tide's out, it's really cool. You can look for hermit crabs and starfish and stuff. On the waterfront this summer, we've had some really nice warm weather um, and some really windy days, so that meant that uh, tubing was really fun. There was some nice chop on the water. Sailing was great because of the, the big gusts that we had. And then during swim time, um, the tide's been out so the kids can wade and those who are more adventurous and want to swim out to the raft have that opportunity. And the water is, it's the warmest water um, north of the Carolinas and uh, the temperature's been awesome. We've had some bath water days where the kids are just loving it. One of the main purposes that Camp Pugwash serves in the Maritime Conference is for our young people to come to camp and come to know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and experience a life uh, with Him, getting to know Him, uh, seeing what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. My favorite part about camp would have to be the, uh, the evening worships. I really enjoy um, praise singing, watching and listening to the kids sing. It sounds beautiful. I learned lots of new songs at the worship, and I learned some actions to songs I didn't know the actions to. The pastors here are inspiring because they tell you great stories about God in a fun and interesting way. I love the stories. I love the songs. It's, it's just really brought me closer, and I'm really happier with God. Like I'm a lot happier. I love Pugwash because God is here, because you can feel His presence. The typical day at Pugwash begins early in the morning with uh, flag raising of the lovely Canadian flag, um, breakfast in the cafeteria, um, a phenomenal worship led by an awesome praise team. Then there's the classes, um, lunch, quiet time where the kids get to chill out, more classes, and then the evening brings on fun and games, and then another worship before they go to bed. We also have big camp activities like uh, Puglimpia, which is our version of the Olympics, which is a really fun time, and I think the kids really enjoy it. Well, as always, my favorite part is the theme song. Then, when I got to carry the candle, that was pretty awesome. I now declare the Paralympic Games to be open! I really like Paralympia because you and your cabin, uh, you get to like, compete in different events like making sand castles and canoe races. I love the watermelon fight. We had to run out to the water and try getting the watermelon. I went down the slide. When I finished, like I was all white with soap. I was like a soap explosion. So I went down the slide and it was really fun, slippery and wet. It's like all soapy and it goes so fast. The barn party, it was really fun. We did apple bobbing, we got to go on horse rides, we got to groom the horses, and we did potato sack races. Donuts on string, that was the best. I really like donuts. We got to do a lot of different stuff at the barn party, so it's really fun. kind of nervous and shy, but then after I talked to the people, they seemed really 
nice and I met lots of people. This is definitely a place to make friends. I came here not knowing anybody and by the end of summer last year I just knew everyone and it was like the second family I guess to me. Here at Pugwash I haven't made so many friends, more friends than I've made at home. And just being here as a camper and now as a staff, it's just been just so eye-opening to me to the whole world. It's a really fun place because you get to make new friends and because you get to play fun games and the food is great and you get to learn more about Jesus. It just makes me feel so happy inside when I come here. Everyone is so open to other people. I don't know how to explain it, it's just so amazing. You come onto this campground and it's like you're just overwhelmed with the whole spiritual atmosphere. I mean, you've got the ocean, you've got the horses, you've got everything, and it's just all these things that God has given, and it's just here, all in one place. It's just amazing. Coming here is probably the funnest time you're ever going to have. You're going to meet lots of people, and you're going to make memories that you'll never forget. There's no better place to spend a week of your summer than a pug wash with the ocean, the weather, the people, the staff, the atmosphere. It's awesome. It's my favorite place to be, and I think it could be your favorite place as well. All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. We're gonna try though one more time. Happy Sabbath, Moncton SDA Church. Okay, it's really good to be seeing you here today in the house of the Lord. Uh, normally we welcome more special visitors and friends and we're definitely doing that this morning. Uh, for anyone, if you're here with us for the first time, can you just raise your hand? Okay, we see a sister at the back, welcome. We are glad to have you here. If you've been here a few times, but you still consider yourself a visitor, can you wave your hand as well? Okay, so, so we see another sister there and two at the back. Okay, thank you for being with us this morning. And I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our members, those who are here with us regularly. You know, every single week, you are a special part of what makes this church what it is. So uh, welcome and glad to have you. All right, this morning we do have a few announcements. So today there will actually be a baptism for uh, Jeanette. Uh, Janetja De Bruyne, sorry if I'm butchering the name, and on July 30th in Pugwash, we'll also be having a baptism for Emerson Souza Frere and Marlene uh, Frere and also Julian, uh, and they're all in the same family. Okay, so that's July 30th in Pugwash. And for this morning, uh, we're having the first reading to accept Brother Michael Allen as our music leader. Uh, he has uh, stepped up to the plate. So this is the official first reading to accept Michael Allen as the music leader at our church. We will follow with voting and the second reading next Sabbath. All right, and in that same vein, uh, Michael also wishes to express uh, gratitude for the gift he received from church. And currently he is at home recovering and he is requesting your prayers. So just keep him prayed up uh, as he recovers uh, from his procedure. For today, we'll also be having our potluck, so we'll be having a fellowship meal and it will follow, immediate, uh, follow the service this morning. Okay, and the Master Guide Outreach Ministry, today we'll be distributing tracks uh, after, in the afternoon, I believe it starts at 2.30 p.m., right? So after our potluck, 
Uh, all are invited to join us as we minister to the community, and the group will be at the Milner, Lawrence, and Mount Royal Streets in Moncton. So that's just, it's very close by here, maybe a five minute drive or less. So if you are interested, you can come out and join us as we minister to the public. All right, and for the months of July and August, uh, there will be no AY in the afternoon, but we will resume in September. So just remember, for July and August, we will have no AY service in the afternoon. Okay, and just a reminder that August 6th will be Children's Sabbath, and children, well, parents, you're being encouraged to have your children participate. Uh, after, I know normally after the service, sometimes we'll have a meeting with the kids. So just listen out for those reminders as well. All right, and these are all the announcements uh, for this Sabbath. So I encourage you to have a wonderful day in the Lord, and I pray that you will receive a blessing from today's service. All right, enjoy the rest of your day. Is that church? Church is now called to worship. We we'll begin with Psalms by reading Psalms 24, 1 to 6. Please stand. Psalms 24, verse 1 to 6. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Verse 2. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Verse 3. Who may ascend the mountains of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Verse 4. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in idols or swear by a false god. Verse 5, sorry, continuing. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Verse 6, praise to the Lord. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Amen.
It is with our nothingness that we approach your mercy throne. We come empty, seeking to be filled. Dear Lord, we are the potter. You are the potter and we are the clay. And today we come to you asking you to allow your Holy Spirit to dwell with us. I am nothing, Lord, without you. And I pray today that you will use me to speak a word to your people. I pray that the message will touch a heart or many hearts. I pray, O oh God, that you will bless the proceedings of the Sabbath and that you will be with us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so we now have the little um, offering, which will be administered by Sister Marilisa, after which we'll have the children's story by Sister Amy. Who would like to pray for the offering? Okay. He raised his hands first, so we'll have him. Isaac. Just want to pray for now. Want to pray for him. Dear Jesus, thank you that we're at the church now and and it's Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, happy Sabbath, children. How are you guys today? Good. Okay, so we're going to do the story. I have something that you guys are going to have to guess who I am first. It's going to be like weather. So it's either a snowstorm or an earthquake. Okay, so let's, I'm going to read. Okay. I'm most common on a warm afternoon. You can see me forming in tall, fluffy clouds. I'm caused by warm, moist air moving up in the winds, then cooling and losing water. Do, do, you, do you know what I am? Go ahead. Do. Close. Wow. I'll, close. I'll warn you when I'm coming by making noise. If you know that I'm coming, it's, the best, it's best to stay inside. If you're outside, you should go in if you can. So if you can't go inside, stay away from water, trees, close, fence, tent poles, flag poles. If I come with lots of noise and lightning, the safest thing is to crouch down with a sleeping bag or clothes over you. Don't lie down. So what do we think? Okay. What am I? Weather. So somebody said, who said thunder? You did? Okay, that was the closest. I'm a thunderstorm. So sometimes people are afraid of me because of my loud thunder and bright lightning. I happen all the time, though, um, through and with common sense, such to stay inside if you can, people will almost always be safe during me. If you're ever afraid during a thunderstorm, say a prayer to Jesus. He's bigger than a thunderstorm. Right? So you are like a shelter from the storm, Isaiah 25, 4. So my little son here wants me to tell this story to go with it. So can you guys be really, really big? Stand up and pretend you're big, big, big. Yep, everybody stand up. Pretend you're tall and big, big, big. Big as you can be. Okay, so there was a Philistine named Goliath, and he was really big, just like that. Okay, you guys can sit down, okay? And he tried to be scary for the Israelites. And just one minute, baby. He tried to be scary, right? Right, because he was big and strong, and he tried yeah. to be tough, okay? And then there was a shepherd boy named David, okay? Do you? Oh, good. And David, he was asked by his father to bring his brothers, who were part of the Israelite army, some food one day. Okay, so David obeyed, and he brought some food. And then he's seen this big, powerful Philistine named Goliath. And he said, I want to fight Dad. someone. Right? Dad, stand up. And everyone was scared, right? But David wasn't scared. And do you know why he wasn't scared? That's right. He knew he had God to help keep him safe and protect him. So he said, yes, I, I will accept and I, I will fight you. So what did he take? What's this? Andy, what's this? Jojo, what's this? It's a rock. It's a stone. So do you think this is what gave David his power? No. What gave David his power? That's right. So when he took his stone and he put it in his slingshot and he threw it and it hit Goliath and he fell down. So who helped him do that? Yeah, who? He was. And who helped him conquer that giant? Right, because he wasn't afraid. It didn't matter how big David was. It didn't matter his size because he was confident and he knew he had God on his side. Right? So you guys always remember that whenever you're doing whatever you're doing, know that you can do anything because you always have God with you. Okay. Do we want to pray? Elizabeth, can I ask you to pray for me, please, to close out our story? Dear Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the nice two stories that the teacher gave to us. Please help us to always pray when we have troubles. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Nice try, Jana.
service by Sister Marilisa and company. Good morning, brethren. Happy Sabbath to you. Welcome to Moncton Church. Uh, we are going to have our song service now. Um, can I ask everyone to stand, please? And take your, song, your songbooks. There's one in the back of the chair. And we will worship the Lord this morning. Our first song this morning is 532, 532. Day by day and with each passing moment. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials there. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. shall be in measure this a pledge to me he made help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises O Lord that I lose not face consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from a Father's hand. One by one, the days the moments flee. Till I reach the promised land. Amen. Amen. Five one six, all the way, my Savior lead me. Can I doubt his tender mercy? 
be my guide. Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, chess each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me So far, I'm hearing you. Thank you. 159. On a hill far away stood the old rugged cross. And as we sing, let us contemplate on. have been there. So let us consider the love of Jesus. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love Oh, 
At this moment, we will have our opening song. Our opening hymn is song number 524. Tea so sweet, sweet to trust, trust in Jesus. Jesus. Church, how's everyone doing? Good, that's great. Today's scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 10 13. So that's 10, 1 Corinthians 10 13. No temptation has overtaken heed. Oh, sorry. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way for escape, that you may be able to bear it. Amen. 
Amen. It's now time for a garden of prayer. If you're so impressed, you can either stand or you can make your press uh, come forward to the altar as we seek the Lord in prayer. Sabbath day. May Lord ask you to remove everything that might be that is unlike you from me so that my prayers might, may be heard. So then Lord we just want to thank you for bringing us into your house. We want to thank you for preserving our life for such a moment. As our dear sister Cornelia is about to break the bread of life, I ask that you will use her like you have never used her before. May we all gain the blessing that we came in search of. And even if we didn't come searching for a blessing, may we leave refreshed. May we leave with a sense of purpose that we are on a mission and that the prize is greater than anything that we can obtain in this life. As the scripture rightly said, there is no temptation will come, but you will be there to help us to overcome those temptations. The temptations that are coming, the trials that are coming is to is to make us stronger for the next, next one that we will face. Those are just the situations that we have to go to to mold us and make us into the individual that you want us to be there, Lord. So as we face these, these, these different trials and tribulations, may we just look on them with joy. It's not easy, but may we look on them as joy to know that you're building us for a greater future. You're building us so that we may live with, in, um, in eternity with you. So we turn over everything to you, dear Lord, all our situation, every trials that we're going through, those who are, go who are in financial difficulties, those who are sick, those who are ailing in whatever form or whatever situation they're facing, dear Lord, we turn them all over to you because we know that you're the great physician. We know that you're the great healer. We know with you all things are possible. So we ask you to take full control in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Sabbath. May the deacon and deaconesses get ready, please. Today, tithes and offering is to our local church budget. We worship the God who makes promises and provides instruction. Our Bible text described the initiative of a widow after she experienced a miracle. A room full, full of jars with oil. She returned to Aisha to express gratitude. Then the prophet spoke these final words to her, live on what is left. Those words stand as a promise about the su sufficiency of God's provision. She does not have to fear for her future. They are also an instruction not to live on borrowed resources. Previously, her family constructed a huge debt which result in a painful consequences. Aisha departed Aisha's departing advice was for her to manage wisely. The Lord does not only provide miracles, but he also teaches us how to use our blessings. The instruction, live on what is left, is more relevant for us today. Across G20 countries, a quarter of people does not, 
do did not agree with the statement before I buy something I carefully consider what whether I can afford it personal financial measures is a major deficiency for our generation bringing a destructive consequences believer believers who have the best intentions to partner in God's mission often do not because their financial are in a mess. These words are unfortunate, a common description of reality. Many do not remember the cause of God and carelessly expends money in holiday assumption, in dresses and follows, and when there is a call for the advancement of the work in the home, on foreign missions, they have nothing to give or to have overdrawn their account. As we claim his promise daily, let us also be diligent in the management of, res of our resources. Some may be struggling not because the Lord has not ready, already blessed them, but of their lack of self-discipline and good management. This week, as we worship with our tithes and regularly offering, let us choose to be better management of God's resources. A deacon, come forward. Pray. Oh, sorry. Let us pray. Lord, your promises bring peace and comfort to us. We thank you for your instructions because they provide us directions for our life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We just want to thank everyone who participated in the program thus far, or in our service uh, thus far. We had um, Sister Marilisa who led out in the, in the little um, offering, and she also did the song service with comp and company, sorry. Uh, we also had Sister Amy who did the children's story there. We had Daniel who did our scripture reading. And we have Sister Nashara who did our, our offertory. Now we are going to go into the what they would refer to as the main meal of the, the, the serving. And that is going to go into the sermon which will be done by Sister Cornelia Finikin. But just before she come, we'll have a special song by Sister Shanice Coombs.
Happy Sabbath, everyone.
Thank you very much, Sister Shanice, for that wonderful song. So every time somebody comes up to do something and they say, Happy Sabbath, I hear them. Happy Sabbath. I have one disclaimer this morning. I'm not here to speak to a sleeping church. I am here to speak to brothers and sisters who are happy for the Sabbath, who are walking with Jesus and are happy that they still have the opportunity to praise God. Happy Sabbath, my brothers and sisters. That sounds much more like it. Happy Sabbath to our viewers online. Thank you for joining us this morning. And just before we get into the subject at hand, we will just have a brief word of prayer before we get into things. Heavenly Father, thank you for the spirit breath of life. We want to acknowledge all that you have done for us. And today we come just asking for your continued guidance. We ask that you allow the Holy Spirit to continue to dwell with us and help us to always have that joy in our heart that Jesus came and died for us. And because of that, we should be eternally grateful. Thank you for all that you will do for us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, the topic is overcoming temptation. And for those of you who were in Sabbath school this morning, I felt like you all heard when I was <laughs> writing my sermon because at one point I didn't want to talk too much because then I would have talked about what I wrote in my sermon. But nevertheless, you will hear it again. <laughs> so in writing my sermon, I you know, was sitting down, praying, meditating, and I was just thinking about what really is temptation. And I came upon so many different definitions or, or choice words that were used to explain what temptation is. And I wrote down these two. It says, something you want to have or do, even though you know you shouldn't. And the second one I wrote down is, the act of enticing someone to sin. Because we live in a fallen world, Temptation is just always going to be present. It's always going to be a part of our lives. We will deal with different temptations at different levels. It might be to be too proud, to be selfish, to be dishonest. Giving in to the lust of our flesh is, is one of the biggest temptations that many will fall. Or simple as eating too much food. We can all be tempted to do different things, but remember, brothers and sisters, temptation is not a sin. Giving in to temptation is the sin. And there are three steps between temptation and sin. And we find this in James 1, verses 14 to 15. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, so follow me, we're drawn away by our own desires. When that desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. There are three sources of temptation and almost every temptation that we faced can go into these three categories. The world, the flesh, the devil. Strange as it sounds, temptation is necessary for our spiritual growth. Do we agree? If it weren't for temptation, we wouldn't be able to choose between good and evil. And if we couldn't choose good when offered an alternative, how would we grow spiritually? Eve was faced with a temptation, and as we know, she fell. And soon after, her husband fell. Christians throughout the ages have fallen prey to the devil and his temptations. And today, we will take a look 
at how from the word of God we can resist and overcome temptations. The devil can't reach God. Is that true? It's not a trick question. The devil cannot reach God, but he will use us to reach him. And for those of you who have kids, you will understand this. If someone wants to hurt you, all they have to do is hurt your kids, and it will definitely have an impact on you. So Jesus feels what we feel, and because of this, the devil will never, ever leave us alone. All temptations are designed to lead the tempted person away from righteousness. Different sins are for different people. And I don't know about you, I've seen people say, oh, I would never do this and I would never do that. And it is true. You'll probably, you'll probably never go to Main Street and try to rob, rob a bank, of course. But the devil knows you love to gossip. The devil, know, the devil knows that you don't have a problem telling that little white lie, right? So he's always going to package your temptation customized to you. He's not going to give you everything. But he knows just what you will do and where you are weak, and that's where he will try to hit you. But the good news is we can always rely on God's promises in everything. In Luke 22, verse 40, Jesus says, pray that you may not enter into, tempta into temptation. He didn't say pray so that you won't face temptation. He says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 17, Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. I think God has a scale in heaven. Do you understand what I mean by that? I think he weighs the temptation for each of us so that, you know, he knows what to give us. So if your temptation seems to be too heavy at any time, understand that God knows something that you don't because he will never give us more than we can bear. As we go back to the scripture reading, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, not who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. None of us can live a holy life. It's a miracle to walk the Christian walk. We can walk it, if we keep our eyes on Jesus. Peter walked on water when his eyes were perfect on Jesus. The minute he took his eyes away, he began to sink. Have you ever noticed it's harder to resist temptation because you neglect your time that you spend with God? Have you ever noticed? There are times when we enter into temptation, and that's a totally different thing from being tempted. So if you know you have a gambling problem, don't go to the restaurant at the casino to have dinner. If you know you have a problem with smoking, don't go around your friends that you know are gonna smoke, right? Don't enter into temptation. Don't show Satan how bad you are or how strong you are. Avoid the temptation. Don't get COVID because you know there is a vaccine. Let Satan come to you. Don't go looking for him. Have you ever spoken to Christians that made bad decisions and then say God will take care of it? Am I missing something? Because we should be walking in the spirit and using our discernment to make good decisions. 
we must avoid situations that lead us into trouble. We cannot stop the devil from coming to us. The devil can tempt us by inviting us. It is our choice to give in. We always have a choice. Remember when you're tempted, you're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And his victory can be your victory. Jesus was not drawn away by his own lust in the wilderness. So God doesn't hold him accountable. The devil came to him. Did Jesus ever sin? Do we want to walk like Jesus? Why would any Christian want to settle for any standard that is lower than Christ? And let's go to Matthew chapter 4. And I think we, we know this story. And we're going to start reading from verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Was this an opportunity for the devil? The devil prefers to come to us when we're weak. Jesus was hungry, so this was his perfect opportunity. Now when the tempter came, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. How did Jesus respond? But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Can you respond in this way when you are tempted? You cannot say it is written if you haven't read it. You didn't hear that. You cannot say it is written if you haven't read it. When you're being tempted by something, use a scripture that goes with it. Don't be tempted by sex and go read, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. That is not going to help you. Jesus said it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Spiritual life is way more important than physical life. It is more important to please God than to please yourself. Let's go to verse 5. Then the devil took him up. So he responded, and the devil never left. The devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if, again, there is doubt, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And here we go. The devil starts to quote scriptures. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So brothers and sisters, when we don't read our Bibles, when we fall asleep, we are giving the devil the power to attack us. Because if the devil can quote scriptures, what are we doing? And Jesus replied again, and Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. This was the second time. And the devil still did not leave. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, 
All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Have you ever thought about what it would mean for us if Christ gave into that temptation and forgot about going to the cross? Think about that for a second. Because at this point, the devil was offering him everything if only he would fall down and worship. Would we have a similar situation to Adam and Eve? You're not with me, church. <laughs> Always build a defense. When Je was Jesus ready to defend himself against the temptation? The devil tempted him once and did not leave him alone, even when he responded more than once, saying, it is written. What do you think the devil is doing with us if he did that to Christ? When God gives you a victory, watch out, because the devil is coming again. A lion doesn't attack you to hurt you. He attacks you to devour you. And this is how the devil works. The devil knows who is more devourable. Do you pray? He looks for the ones who are easy and he doesn't have to spend much time on. How do we get the devil out of our lives? The same way we get the darkness out of our room, by turning the light on. Invite the Holy Spirit, turn on the light of Christ. The devil and Christ cannot coexist. They don't coexist very well. The minute one comes in, the other leaves. They don't coexist very well. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he, he will flee. God's word, brothers and sisters, is our only defense. Think about spiritual things all the time. Do not give room to temptation. Keep your mind occupied. Hymns on your lips and in your hearts. Keep your associates well, even in the church. Find a people who are in love with Jesus. And how do you know they're in love with Jesus? They never stop talking about Jesus. My young people, you're all, or most of you are going off to different schools, universities, colleges. Sex is such a prevalent temptation, and I know that you will face a lot, but remember to stick to your faith. The Bible says, flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Let us practice not to fall, because each time we fall, it becomes easier for us to continue to fall. Practice to resist out of love of God, and it will become easier to resist. Ask God to put hatred in our hearts for sin. And once we do that, we will not want to sin. Make decisions on principle, not on how you feel. And make decisions on how it affects God and not other people. My brothers and sisters, the message is simple. Now is the time to take our relationship with Jesus more seriously. We need to be more spiritually minded, even in the church. Walking in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 verses 5 to 11. Turn with me in your Bibles. I'm 
we'll start at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. But what happens if you fall? You do everything that is humanly possible, everything that you can do, and you fall. What do you do? Do not stay down. Do not continue to believe the devil's lie and continue in your sin. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is our greatest example. In the form of man, he prayed, he fasted, he tithed, he witnessed, and he read the word. When Satan comes with his temptations, point to the cross. Remind him Jesus came and died for you. Remember the, the reward. And Romans 8 verse 18 tells us this very well. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Do not trade your angel wings for worms. My plea to you today is, do you want to be washed in the blood of Jesus? His blood will cover you. You were sanctified justified? Do you want to walk in victory? Do you want to live a new life in Christ? Do you want to experience Jesus in a new way? Today I say yes. God, I want to make good decisions and how they affect you. And when I make a decision, I want to stick by it. I don't know, but I'm willing to accept the power of the Holy Spirit. Teach me how to claim your promises over my life, knowing in you, Lord, I can be forgiven, cleansed, and be made new. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. At this time, I will ask Pastor Dave to pray for us as we close and then we will have the closing hymn shall we pray yeah. heavenly father he that is greater in me is greater than in the world father we need to learn the lesson to trust you. Our lesson showed us that every time we stop trusting in you and trust in ourselves, things are going to go wrong. So Father, as we reflect on the encouragement that we have that we can overcome temptations, Father, I just pray that you would be with each one of us 
And may we put your words and your commandments in our heart that it's easy to recall your words when we are tempted. Thank you for promising us that you are always there for us. Now bless us and keep us through this next week. And we pray that you will bless the baptism that's about to take place as well. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let us stand as we do our closing hymn. Song number 290, O soul, are you weary and troubled? <clears throat> 290. 290. 290. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
All right, so we are just transitioning to our baptism ser our service. So they have went to change. So what we're going to do, we're going to sing another song as they continue to prepare for the baptism. After that, after the baptism, then we'll go, those of you who want to stay, you're all encouraged to stay with us for our potluck. And then at 2.30, we are going out on a truck, truck distribution. As was mentioned this morning, we'll be going to... It's about three minutes drive from here, or, or less. So we ask you to come and um, participate in that as well. So we have another song, after which the, the baptismal party should be, should be ready. Please have a seat. We'll continue for our singing. 309, ah, all to Jesus I surrender.
So our next song will be more about Jesus, 245, hymn number 245. here there we go thank you I went and visited Jenna last night we had a very good time we had a very good time and I'll tell you something church she was watching the GC and she heard him talk about I will go go yes and she called me earlier this week and she said I have to think of ways that I can tell others of Jesus because I'm older. I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but I'll tell you she's the same age as my mother. So if you can figure it out from that, then you're, you'll do okay. Huh? And you can be my son. I can be your son. Thank you. I would be honored to do that because as I sat and talked with her last night, she was telling me ways that she's already envisioned of sharing the gospel. My question for you is how many of you have spent that time thinking, how can I share the gospel? How can I go? And you don't have to leave the house because she said, I can't drive. She's got it figured out that in her senior's home, she can go and witness to the people in her building. Oh, she can't do it in her building. Okay. But, okay. but you can tell your friends. Yeah. There you go. 
things that we can see in you that you have lived different. Yes. It makes a difference, doesn't it? What would your favorite Bible text be? upon your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path amen, amen. so church what we're going to do is we're about to put her into the baptismal waters but before we do that we are going to take a vote to vote her into membership subject to baptism okay so do i have a motion to accept her into membership subject to baptism Okay, I see, I see some hands. Now, do, do we have a second? Okay, now, I, church, I, I, I want to ask a favor of you. Instead of raising your hand to, to um, vote the final vote here, I think, can you see them if they stand up? Okay, she can see you if they stand up, but she can't see your hands go up. So would you vote by please standing? if you are wanting to have her come into membership of the church. Do you see that? Do you see that? They're all gonna be, be your helpers and your family. So before we go into the baptismal waters, I've got a couple questions I'm gonna ask you. Okay, do you love Jesus? Oh, I do, yes. You may be seated. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? He did, he did, he did. Do you believe he's coming again to take us home? Yes, he, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, she answers before I even ask the questions, doesn't she? Amen. A Amen, guys. Come on. This is, you know, the angels are having a party. They're celebrating. They're rejoicing because there is another person giving their life to them. And now my last question for you. Is it your desire to become a member of the Moncton Seventh-day Adventist Church? I do, yes, I do. She has so much enthusiasm. I just, I tell you what, the time just flew as I was visiting her last night. And uh, I look forward. We're actually, we've already set up another appointment where we're going to get together again. And, and I'm looking forward to it. And so, you know, I think, Jenna, that we can start heading towards the baptismal tank now, okay? Yeah, you know, the devil had been beating me. He thought he beat me because he made, I could not use my left leg. I could not stand on it. Mm -hmm. I had to have a cane or my wagon. And but during the night, I said, Lord, help me. I didn't, don't want him around me any longer. During the middle of the night, I know it was gone, almost gone. And this morning, it was gone. And that was almost unbelievable. It was hard to Amen. Be. Amen. She was in a lot of pain when I got there last night. She had her knee in a brace and everything else. And now it's all gone. Jesus took that away. All right, let's go make a public affirmation of what we just talked about, okay? All right. While they're making their way, we can uh, softly sing. Three hundred and six Jominera. I am thine. Thirty-two. 
Draw me near. you could see it Jenna because the people in the audience are smiling and they're grinning from ear to ear thank you thank you I love all of you and it's such a privilege Jenna mm -hmm. because you have made the decision to follow Jesus mm -hmm. and because you want to follow him all the oh, way oh, all the way it is now my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the opportunity to choose to follow you. We thank you that I'm Jenna never, has, never too old. you're never too old to follow Jesus, Lord. She is so excited to follow you, and I just pray that you will give her many opportunities to share the good news of your salvation with everyone around her. Father, I just pray that you will continue to bless her, that you will continue to be with her. She loves you, 
And all she wants is to let people know that you are her savior yes. and her friend. Yes. And so, Father, we just ask that you will put her into your arms yes. and take care of her. Yes. We ask yes. this in Jesus' precious name. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's better than go to a nursing home. <laughs> Is there, you know, before I leave, just sometimes there's people that are sitting out there that haven't made that decision to follow Jesus yet. And if you would like to study with somebody from the church here, if you would like to make this same decision, would you recommend that they do it sooner than what you did here? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you how old she you is can again. I'll, make it, I'll remember her this. Yes, we want to, the younger you are, the more years you get to serve Jesus. And so if you have not made the decision to follow Jesus yet, if you just raise your hand or afterwards talk to Elbert or one of the elders, you know, they would love to start you on that journey in a relationship with Jesus that is going to be the most incredible walk of your life. And so please, please don't, don't put it off. It is the most important decision you will ever make. This is my second baptism, but the first time I did not know everything. Right. And so but now we've done learned, it again. I have learned a lot. Oh, <laughs> amen. Amen. Let us sing 526, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. When we give our lives to the Lord, he takes away our fear and we become bold. 526.
Church. We will now uh, depart for a potluck. Please be seated as the deacon escort you out. Thank you. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This program was made possible thanks to our generous sponsors and partners. Thank you.